We hope that everyone is enjoying the second day of the Ableton Loop 2017. Though the moderator of this next piece needs no introduction, we're going to do it anyway. Please welcome to the stage, Peter Kern. I might need some introduction. <laughs> it, but only at Ableton Loop would I not need any introduction. <laughs> Most places I would need some sort of introduction. But I will introduce uh, uh, Francis Prev. So we have a, a unique situation. Francis is, could, could certainly do this alone, but we, we need to moderate um, even him as one person. Um, I don't know if I'm moderating between you and something else, or moderating between different versions of you. Uh, but Francis's background, I think, is, is, is sort of singular and unique in that there's, I can't think of other people who fit into exactly the set of categories that, that Fran does in his work, uh, both as a, as a sound designer, as a producer, um, as a, a music journalist. There are not so many people who are able to really be on top of the craft of creating sounds, but also the, the craft of how you teach that technique and then how you sort of articulate that as a, as a writer. So I would say your experience kind of in, in creating sounds is, is not just about, as it is for many producers, how to do that within the paradigm of, of just your own music, but being able to satisfy your own music and then also the needs of many, many music technology vendors, one of them being Ableton, but, but just one of them, uh, and, um, and then also to the ability to kind of teach other people how to do that. So as I understand it, our, our goal for today is actually going to be not just to talk about the, the production of those things, but to also talk about the technique of, of listening. Correct. So um, I think I th let's start, I guess, by, by listening to something. Yes. And wake up our ears, <laughs> um, because I think our active listening starts to get a bit numb at events like this. So what are we going to listen to? OK, so uh, some of you may know that I, uh, I, for many years I was a DJ. And uh, about two years ago, I retired, and I haven't performed live in a, a very long two years. And um, right now, I'd like to just indulge me for a second. I wanna, I'm only going to play one minute um, of a very important piece by John Cage called 433. <laughs> so, one minute. Close enough. How many people are already familiar with 433? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that makes me so happy. It's an educated audience. Do you understand the purpose of 433? It's for you to listen to the room and for you to listen to all the ambient noises and to interpret that however, you, however that resonates with you. Um, about, I've been working on a project for two years now, um, on and off, because it requires a lot of concentration and focus as I work on it. Um, is anybody in the room familiar with my Scapes project? No? A couple of people. All right. More people so, need to read my website, then. <laughs> see, more people need to visit Create Digital Music um, Media. So um, I'm going to play um, the first Scape. What you need to know when I play this is that it's completely synthesized. So the goal of Scapes was to take, um, I feel that for millennia, um, we have used music as our singular art form for the sense of hearing. Um, whereas for vision, we have fashion, we have painting, we have photography, we have architecture, we have sculpture, we have, and the list goes on. But for hearing, all we have is music. So what I wanted to do because we have tools like Ableton, and we have tools with the most sophisticated soft sense. Um, and I wanted to create something that was rep representational, but not music. So I worked on this project called Scapes. And what these are are completely synthesized field recordings. All I used was operator and a bunch of effects and everything inside suite.
All of these projects are available. What? Yeah, no, I was just laughing. All of these projects are available on my website, so I'm not going to deconstruct it. If you want to take a look at it, you can go to the website. Could you turn it down just a smidge? They're a little bit more effective when they're a tad quieter. Um, this next one is a simulation of a brook with a bird song. So these are just two of the scapes that are up there. There are several others. And uh, again, I release them as downloadable Ableton project files because as a college professor and a sound designer, I love to teach. I'm not the kind of person who is um, stingy about, um, about their understanding of uh, sound design. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I want to talk about today is, let me open the next file, is about how we listen to our environment. What had happened was I was a preset designer, and for many years as a preset designer, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons manufacturers hired me is they would be able to give me a playlist off of Spotify or a bunch of tracks, and they'd say, we need these sounds. And I would be able to listen to the sounds, and I would be able to reverse engineer them, mm -hmm. um, because as a, as a youth, there was no place to learn synthesis. So I got synthesizers and put on Depeche Mode records. And I just sat and went back and forth, synth, Depeche Mode, synth, Depeche Mode, until it sounded right. And then it got progressively um, more sophisticated, until, at which point I was able to build something of a career from that. Um, one of the most, what has happened since then, since I, uh, as a preset designer, I kind of, I don't want to say I got bored, because I still love doing preset design, but I really wanted to go further with it. I really wanted to um, explore sound itself, and I found myself walking around city streets or in a park and listening to everything, and then sort of reverse engineering it. And then going, oh yeah, that, that bird is actually a sine wave with a pitch envelope on it, uh, maybe a little bit of FM. Um, and it, would, it sort of expanded from there. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is just talk about the basics of how we perceive the sounds around us and how we perceive the sounds in the tracks that we like. Um, and listening is sound design is a language, and listening enables you to expand your vocabulary. So this is an obvious one to many of you, but white noise is the most pervasive sound in nature. As a matter of fact, I uh, just recently returned from um, a camping trip in Colorado, and uh, just as a test, I was at the top of a mountain pass. No traffic, no cars. "Quote unquote silent," but there was this noise floor everywhere, and I realized that reality itself had a noise floor. And uh, I mean, we those of us who are doing sound design um, know that you, with noise you can those are waves. If we add a little bit of resonance, then we get wind. Soundtrack guys who are working in film know that if you take white noise and lower the cutoff frequency, that's the interior of a jet airplane. If we lower the cutoff frequency further and increase the resonance, we get a fighter jet. If we go further and increase the resonance more, this is the sound of a spacecraft, which shouldn't make a sound because there's no oxygen in space. Um, well, you have the, the, the warp drive. The well, warp the, missiles. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. the, yeah the, the, this is the interior of the, of the spacecraft. Yeah. As it, as Electrical doing, systems, all that good stuff. As it's doing a flyby. But that's just to demonstrate that white noise is 
absolutely everywhere, or pink noise or blue noise. Um, and acoustic properties, for instance, doors, are low-pass filters. Walls are low-pass filters. So as I'm designing things for the scapes, I'm thinking in terms of, well, a wall is a low-pass filter. I need to muffle this sound, so I create the sound. I, I make it more textured, and then I put it in another room by using a low-pass filter. And that's simply because I'm developing a language. So, and it's a language that absolutely everybody can learn simply by listening. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that um, some, of you, uh, some of you are familiar with Daniel Levitin in a book, This Is Your Brain on Music. Raise your hand. I'm just curious how many people are familiar. Okay, everybody who didn't raise their hand, go get that book. Um, it's probably one of the best treatises on understanding how we hear, how we perceive music, how we perceive sound. Um, and uh, <clears throat> pages 44 through, 40, or through 55 of that book have a really interesting dissection of how we identify musical instruments. And we identify musical instruments largely from, their, from both their timbre, their harmonic content, which I'll talk about in a second, but also from their envelope. So everybody knows what a sine wave is. It contains no harmonic content whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sine wave. Let me lower the volume slightly. I'm going to take that sine wave, which has no harmonics, and just by playing with the amplitude envelope, I'm going to soften the attack, and that sine wave, despite the fact it won't have any harmonics, we get a woodwind. If we take that same sine wave, and we give it a very, very fast decay and go higher in the octave range, we get a xylophone, despite the fact that it's a sine wave. This is all our ears cluing into what instrument we're hearing exclusively from the amplifier envelope. Um, if I increase the decay time and the release time, we get bells. So understanding that, that language of the amplifier envelope, for those of you who are, want to pursue sound design in a, a more concrete manner, it's so important to understand that just the simple element of the amplifier envelope is going to be your starting point for a new sound. So when I listen to a track, I mean, some, for some of you, this is going to be really obvious. But for others who are working with presets and dialing through the presets in a, in, a, in a synth, looking for the right sound for their musical composition, being able to at least understand what elements they want to edit is the perfect starting point for learning how to create your own sounds. Um, in terms of listening and, and synthesis, um, we already know how to identify musical instruments like, for instance, guitar, flute, etc. I'm just going to play a few of these, but our ears already know, we already understand the language of being able to hear this. And go, that's not operator, right? Just what? To, just no, to that, that, that's that not, no, no, I, that's yeah. not escape. No, I, that's, yeah. that's an actual acoustic <laughs> uh, guitar loop. And then if we, I'm going to lower the volume a little bit more so it's not too overwhelming. We instantly know that that's an electric guitar. Our brains don't have to go, oh, well, what's that thing I'm hearing? So if we take it a step further, electric bass, flute. Our, we know because we have a bit of a, we already have that language in our repertoire. So it's a matter, in terms of designing sounds with synths, it's a matter of translating that language that we already know for identifying musical instruments to identifying waveforms. And one of the ways to do that, well, I'll just show you in, in terms of timbre in the uh, harmonic series. Uh, I wish I could make this. Could, is this set to zoom in? Oh, no, nope, it's not in a US keyboard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so right here, OK, let me switch over to my, oh, one last thing about envelopes that I wanted to touch on. If I shorten this envelope, oh, I'm going to switch over here to the pitch envelope. If I use a pitch envelope, it's a water droplet. If 
we go higher, if we make the pitch envelope go higher, we get bird cheeps. And it's learning that language. It's like when I hear a bird cheeping, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that pitch envelope. And it's, it, it becomes sort of, um, I've referred to it in the past as subtitles. So as I'm listening to the world around me, it's like I've got these subtitles going. And it gets really distracting sometimes. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about in terms of the harmonic series is like even with just the first 16 harmonics, some of you may already be aware that the Hammond B3 was the first additive synth. Well, if we want to go back to the telharmonium, we could do that. But, um, and the thing we associate with the Hammond B3 is the third harmonic. And it's simply three sine waves playing together that gives us the illusion of an organ. Um, in the case of, let me switch to another one here. Chimes, what we call, you know, what we, what we, what we think of as metallic bells. Let me bring the volume down again. I'm gonna give this a longer release as I did earlier. But bells have widely spaced harmonics and many of the, the additional notes Now, if we had to tune those slightly, we would get something that sounded even more organic. But understanding in terms of the harmonic spectrum that bells are simply a few widely spaced sine waves with the right amp envelope gives us a bit more of that language. The next, if we use even more harmonics to play with, um, I set this up in advance because it takes a second to dial in, but, oops. You can bring down the volume on that a little bit. Some of you will start to hear a sort of bassoon or vocal-like quality, and that's because of being able to sculpt harmonics. And so on and so forth. So formants allow us to get vowel-like sounds, more nasal textures, and if we take one of these nasal textures and then spike a few of the harmonics, we can create hybrid sounds that, are both, that have characteristics of both bells and formants. Finally, one of the other things I want to talk about in terms of learning how to listen and learning how to apply these, these skills is we're going to start we're, understanding the, the harmonic series, understanding amp envelopes, understanding timbre envelopes. Um, at that point, it's time to sort of think about how that translates into synthesis itself. And most of us are most familiar with analog synths, so I'm just going to do two very quick sounds. Um, understanding that a sawtooth wave is the basis for emulating, and I do say emulating, um, brass and strings. If I take a sawtooth wave, which is the, you know, sort of sort of standard, let me bring that down a little bit, oops, opposite direction, there we go. I'm going to take that and I'm going to give it the correct amplifier envelope. I'm going to give it a longer release, I'm going to switch over to my effects, and I'm going to throw in a chorus, followed by a reverb, followed by another chorus. I'm going to make a couple of adjustments. I love doing sound design without listening. Um, and then we get strings instantly. And the art of being able to get a string sound that quickly, and for some of you this may be old hat, but for others, learning that the texture of a sawtooth is how we instantly create strings, or how we instantly create brass, or how we instantly create, if we use a stack of them, EDM power chords. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then understanding that the alternate to the sawtooth, which contains all integer harmonics descending in volume linearly, um, we can switch to something called the square wave, which contains only odd integer harmonics. And the square wave, being the most easy to produce digitally, is the chiptune sound. But if we switch our envelope over here to the flute-like envelope that we had earlier, and then back off on our filter cutoff. We get something closer to a recorder or a clarinet. And if we turn off that filter, 
or back to Nintendo. So it's really a matter of understanding the qualities of the harmonic characteristics of each of the sort of standard analog waveforms and then modifying them with what we are building a language for. Um, at that point, the one last thing that I wanted to point out before Peter and I talk about this um, is that presets, whenever you dial up a preset in a synth, it's open source. We talk about open source code. We talk about you know, the, the joys of, of, of various um, being able to look at the code and modify it and learn from the code. But it's always a little surprising to me that people don't open up their presets and look at how the parameters are arranged in order to get the sounds they like. So if you're, going, if you're dying through the presets in your synth, and you're like, I really like that sound, well, open it up, look at the parameters, adjust each one, and figure out why, how they're interacting with each other and why the sound sounds as it does. And then you can use that as a starting point for learning what sounds you naturally gravitate towards in terms of, in the same way with cooking, you know, we learn different spices. And it's like you might find, oh, I like rosemary a lot. Rosemary's really good in, in gravy. I like, I like rosemary in my potatoes. Um, so learn what the rosemary is in the presets that you like. And then you can add that spice to the presets that you want to customize your music to the point where you're speaking in a more natural voice that's unique to you. Good. Yeah. Thanks for our answer. All right, let's, talk. Let's, let's sit down and talk. Good. Good. Thank you. Well, so... Let's get, let's get comfy. <clears throat> let's get comfy. This is vodka, Better. everybody. Yeah, because exactly. Both of these, that's, that's how we're that's what we meant so by, That's what we meant by comfy. Mm -hmm. um, well, f first, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, what, what drives you? I mean, obviously, if you, if you're, if you have to walk into your, the course that you're teaching, mm -hmm. then being able to have things available as teaching tools is important. Mm -hmm. But why, is it why was it important with the Scapes project or with other stuff that you're doing? Why, is, why, why do you feel this sort of compulsion to teach other people what you're doing? Um, why, I mean, why, why share that with, <laughs> why share that, not, not necessarily why not keep it secret, but why, why is teaching something that's sort of important to your practice? Um, if I'm going to be really honest, they're both, they're both kind of quote-unquote selfish reasons, although they may appear altruistic. The first one is that I want to, I want to leave footprints. Every human being wants to leave footprints. And I know that this knowledge that I've acquired over the 30 years I've been doing this, I know as a college professor it has value. I know that many of my students have gone on to some really, really interesting things. Hmm. Um, and I love seeing that. Not in an ego -y way, because they do the work. But it, if anybody's ever gardened, it's the same sort of gratification that you get from gardening. You know, where you're, where, you're, where you're nurturing plants, you're planting a seed, you're, let, you're letting it grow, and it grows into its own plant. I don't take credit for the plant. I'm not, you know, restructuring its DNA. I'm just give it, I'm giving it what, what you know, I, 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 I don't think anybody can really articulate why they like gardening. Hmm. You know, some people just like gardening, and this is like gardening for me. The other thing is, I, in terms of my own musical tastes, I'm most interested in the things I haven't heard yet. And as a preset designer, I'm always trying to make presets that are going to be unique, but not so unique that they're unusable. I always try to make something that's got a little bit more of a fingerprint to it. Um, and that's partly because I want to listen to music I like more. So I want to teach people to speak with their own voice uh, from a timbral or, a, or an instrumental uh, quality, simply because I want more interesting music out there. Mm. But there's a so there's a but there's a taste factor to that too. In other yeah. words, you're 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 selecting sounds that come from from music that inspires you, and and you're kind of building those into the those sounds into the presets. Or no, when I do presets, I try to do a broader a broader range um, because I understand that I don't I don't want, I mean like I have an aesthetic all caps spaces in between each. Um, I have an aesthetic that that 
appeals to me because of, you know, simply because I grew up on a lot of new romantic music, new waves, so on and so forth. But at the same time, as, a, as an artist, I've evolved. I did house music, tech house music, you know, electro. So I, I have a really broad palette of music that I've liked over the years. Um, and I, use, I draw from that as inspiration, but I really, when I'm making sounds, I don't make effecty sounds. I like sounds that are instruments. Um, so, yes, I have my, my personal preferences, but I'm also catering to the manufacturer I'm working for. When I work for Korg, I do a certain kind of sound when I, you know, certain, they request certain types of sounds. When I work for Ableton, they request certain types of sounds. So when, you know, when I work with Dave Smith, he's like, do whatever the hell you want. So, um, you know, different manufacturers have different needs, and I, I definitely try to appeal to their audience. Can, can we reveal what, what kind of sounds Ableton are looking for? <laughs> Where's that? Um, Ableton, what I, what I am able to talk about is that um, Ableton is, in, if anybody's looked at 10, um, there are packs that are, that are they're very tailored now mm -hmm. to either specific genres or, or even specific moods or approaches, and that tailoring is, has, is one of my tasks now where I'm like, they, they say, okay, well, we, we need something that's, and they're being a little bit specific about it, and then I, you know, have a reference that I, that I draw from, sort of like a sort of genre references. Um, but at the same time, they also give me a lot of creative lateral. All right. No, that's fair. So. Well, let's actually, let's, let's talk a little bit about Ableton, because what, what strikes me about, uh, I mean, not that we're obligated to do that, but what, what, what strikes me about kind of the, the demos that you did is that once you're sort of aware of what you're doing, you see instruments like operator, Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a different way, right? I mean, in the, kind of once you know what you're doing, that set of tools is, is enough. It's, so some of this kind of, it, it is some of the sort of fever of like trying to find lots of other plugins and modules. I mean, is some of that just kind of coming from people not being able to actively produce the sounds that they want to hear? And is there, is there something kind of, I mean, is there, even for you, is there something kind of focusing about being able to remove those distractions and just say, okay, I'm going to, focus on operator and make the sounds that I want to produce? Um, I actually did a workshop yesterday on sound design um, upstairs in one of the studios and I had a similar question. And uh, I've said, my, my response there, and uh, to give it a little bit more nuance here, is it's really, you're going to do more if you learn one synth hmm. inside and out. And if you pick a synth that's as flexible as something like operator, or you know, in the non-Ableton world, something like X for Serum, or you know, or or Wavetable, which is one of the new new synths in Ten. Um, if you pick something that's going to be versatile out of the box, then mastering that is going to give you a, a much wider palette than picking a, a very narrowly focused instrument, like for instance, mastering the 303. I'm not sure that <laughs> I'm not sure that that's going to take very long, um, but when you pick something like when, like operator that that just it has so much depth between the additive sections, um, the fact that it does FM, the fact that it's got some really really beautiful analog filters in it, um, this just so if you master one instrument that does a lot and spend all your time on that. And that's going to give you, you know, a, a, a much better understanding of exactly how everything works. Hmm. I mean, you kind of, i guess you also are sort of called upon to work with particular instruments because you're doing a review, mm -hmm. or because you're asked to do a set of sound designs for things. Are you ever kind of having to? Do you ever find that you have to kind of make conscious decisions about limiting what you're working with, or is that is that coming naturally to you at this point because it's it's kind of part of the gig? Well, I'm not allowed to review products I've worked on. Right. So, and, I'm, and I'm, I, I, I personally maintain that journalistic integrity. I don't want ever, anybody to think that my work is all just a giant advertorial. So I specifically, I tell my editor, no, I worked on, I worked on Gadget, I can't do a review. But mm -hmm. I can do a master class. Mm -hmm. So then I'll write, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my experiences in, in doing sound design for Gadget or Ableton or Serum or, or something for Korg. Uh, you know, one of, one of the, I just did one on the Minilog and Monolog. Um, and I'll, I'll take my experience, so rather than putting it in the context of a review and going, oh, this is just the best thing ever, um, I will, I'll, I'll talk about it as, well, this is how you get the most out of it. Hmm. So. 
how is it, is it, is it different for you then when you're kind of actively sort of producing sounds with something versus when you sort of pull something for a review? What's the, since you've, you've described kind of what the synthetic uh, sound design approach is like, mm -hmm. um, how is it different if you're kind of, you're handed a synth and you're picking apart other people's presets and using somebody else's instrument? Um, what's oh, I that never, experience I never like? listen to the presets when I get a synth. Ah, okay. <laughs> I like. I, I just. I. I will sort of as, as it, you know. If I if it's a product that I haven't worked on and I am able to do a review on it, that'll sort of be like an afterthought. I'm much more interested in talking about the engine yeah. of the synth, and then I'll be. Oh yeah, I forgot to look at the presets. So then I'll look at the presets, and and the, you know that's simply because that's just where where my lasers are focused. Mm -hmm. So um, when I'm looking, and then when I look at the presets, I'm sometimes I'll get a synth that's really. The presets are a little too timely. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's instantly going to be out of date too, right? I mean, right, if you, right. yeah, if you, I, I, if you I, make I, a bunch of presets that are kind of this is the the sound of production right yeah, now. I, by the time you've used it, it's it's over. I did so, I did I did an interview uh, a few weeks back, and I uh, I referred to those sounds as jorts presets. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't, I don't know how, who's familiar with jorts. But jorts Not jorts those, the producer, the, but jorts, jorts the jorts the gene. Shorts that were really, really popular in like 1998. Um, so, and they'll come back. I mean, jorts. I, I actually I would imagine they're probably big in Brooklyn right now. But um, the, uh, but jorts, ironically, ironically, <laughs> this week, yeah. yeah. So, but the thing is, I I, I don't want to make I, I I I tend to dislike presets where you can very quickly tell what year they were made. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge market for that though. And that's important because there are producers who are very good at coming up with melodies and chords and arrangements and, and, and producing and do, you know, don't have the time to invest in developing the skill set to make the, at the time, the skill set to develop their own sound. So they do need presets. And it's like, I need to make a very specific kind of dark techno track or a very specific kind of EDM track. I need these sounds. And they are fulfilling a need, but that's just not my voice as an artist. You know. Were you ever? Do you ever feel like you were at that stage where you need to kind of pull up presets and pick them apart and I've figure never, out how they worked? I, no, no. You've always been a genius. No, I don't even. I, <laughs> no, well, I mean, I, my first synths were had knobs, and yeah, like my, when my yeah. first synth was was a Moog that didn't have presets, I always I always had to dial in the sound every time I played it. Yeah, this is the Especially this is the disadvantage live. for those of us who had like the first synth I had was a Roland Sound Canvas, and then I right. immediately needed to find my way into the presets to make it stop sounding like it was already sounding. This, right. There's something nice about it, uh, something that is tactile and um, that that doesn't work that way. Well, right? and that's one of the things that I'm I'm very optimistic about with regards to the current uh, the current movement in analog, where you can get something like the Arturia Mini Brute, which doesn't have presets. So if you want to make a sound, you have got to start from square one. And I'm really hoping that, that this generation that's, that's starting with these knob-covered, all, you know, all very preset, not, not preset-centric analog synths, like the monologue, the mini-log, anything that's festooned with knobs and buttons um, is an opportunity for you to instantly start working with your own sounds rather than dialing mm. through the presets. So Yeah, I would say probably, I, I don't know, I guess I would defend the TBO3. It was, I mean, even I if you... You hate that synth. I hate it. Why do you hate the 303? Um, um, Only one I, 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 it's, it's not, I mean, I understand its value. I mean, I understand it's, it, why it's iconic. I understand its use. I'm just not a huge resonance fan. Ooh, well, that's a good. Thing. <laughs> so it's if like you don't I like, like I like resonance. Then I like you're really resonance. not gonna I, like the three hundred three. I like yeah. it. it's uh, <laughs> resonance. Resonance is like cilantro. <laughs> <laughs> a little goes a long way. So, um, and but and, do you like cilantro? I like cilantro. Okay. Yeah, I make a really nice cucumber, chickpea, mm. um, tomato cilantro salad. Yeah. Mm. Shall we? Well, I want to do a quick little poll here. I've been yeah. sort of doing it informally at Loop. Raise your hand if you self-identify as a foodie. Just a few. No, a fair amount. I notice a, a, a really high number of producers and musicians self-identify as foodies. It was hard, I think, a few years ago in Berlin to be a foodie and move here. It's getting easier. Ah. <laughs> so that could have something to do with it. Got it. Um, should we talk about, since we're talking about uh, the design of instruments and sound design, shall we open the modular can of worms, 
<laughs> yeah, we can totally open the modular can of worms. Hopefully well, I mean, because it, it 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 strikes me that part of the you know part of the argument you get from the modular crowd is is also people wanting to get away from this preset phenomenon. Um, and and sometimes the sort of the gospel of modular is that it's necessary to work with these kind of hardware modules because the computer will somehow not allow you to to construct original sounds. Mm -hmm. Now I, I think we know that that's I think we know that that's not true. But what? How how would you relate kind of sort of like what we saw you doing with the computer with um, mm -hmm. the built-in devices in mm -hmm. Ableton and 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 what you get from a what what you get from a modular environment in terms of choice? There are pros and cons, um, and I'm passionate about the pros and I'm passionate about the cons. The biggest pro that I'm passionate about with regards to modulars is you are forced to listen as you work. It's not like working in a, in a graphic environment or a preset environment. You are forced to listen and dial in, it veer towards whatever your personal aesthetic preferences are. So big fan of that. Um, I'm a big fan of the possibility that as a college professor, I still, I'm, I'm witnessing is still kind of untapped, as, and that is that modulars um, are the ultimate environment for learning how an envelope works with an oscillator and how a, mm. an oscillator works with a filter. However, I'm somewhat disappointed by the fact that people just like to grab the cables, a glass of wine, a joint, and then start plugging things in until it, ah, that sounds really, really cool. I like the first part of that, but yeah, I, I'm with you at the end where that went. <laughs> right, yeah, where it's just, you know, you're plugging it in and you're, you're, you're you know, you're, you're experimenting. But, and this, this ties in with, with my thoughts on experimentation um, for artists. Is it, when scientists do an experiment, they don't just randomly grab two beakers of chemicals and pour them together to see what happens. They have a goal with the experiment. They have a target that they're, they're moving toward that the experiment either proves or disproves. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's the best way to be experimental with a synth, not just, I wonder what happens if, dot, dot, dot. I think that that's like, unless you can repeat it, your experiment hasn't, hasn't given you any new information. Well, I wanted to get a little, a little deeper into that, because we've, okay. we've had some life conversations about how, you know, how, how much kind of new and unexpected experience we can still have in the, in the future, right? So the question is, how much, how much do you find that you're still able to discover new sounds by listening, and how much do you feel like you're able to kind of discover new sounds with experimentation, even if that experimentation is That's is why I'm on escapes. Mm -hmm. I'd reached, I'd hit the wall uh, with regards to preset design. And I was like, okay, well, let's let's start let's start emulating reality. Hmm. I mean, I, I I I having done it for 35 years. I mean, like if we talk about, you know, I, I don't mean this in a boastful way. I just mean I'm 51, and I got my first synth when I was 15. And if we're going to give any credence to Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule, I'm at 35,000 hours. Hmm. So. I would really like to. I mean, so nature. Let's you know. Let's well, there, and there's play a, God. There's a lot of nature to to emulate, yeah. right? There's a lot yeah. of sound out in the natural world. Absolutely. Um, where where do you kind of where do you sort of imagine going next to 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 hear sounds out in the natural world? The rainy day city thing. I feel like that was a that I've, I've got that in my ear mm -hmm. after six years in Berlin. <laughs> um, right. I think that was three hundred fifty thousand hours of of rainy city days. <laughs> Um, but yeah, where, where else do you kind of imagine seeking out new sounds? Or where, where do you hope that people kind of discovering your project, where might they go sort of looking for new well, sounds in nature? For if, we were, if we're, I mean, the, the, I mean, the lower hanging fruit, obviously, is going to be weather, waves, wind. If you open up the, if you download the Rainy City Walk, I had to use eight tracks of different types of noise-based elements in order to get rain because you've got to get the droplets that are in your acoustic proximity, and then you've got to go a little bit further out, and then you've got to get the reflections off the various buildings and the, you know, the sort of the sheets of rain, and then you've got to blend them so that it sounds, you know, and it takes a long time to blend. But start with weather. Weather is a definitely a, 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 a something that you can, people, okay, and this ties in with modulars. Don't underestimate the value of dopamine. 
The reason people like modulars is because whenever we purchase anything, whether it's a new purse, new pair of shoes, or you know, a new malt, we get a little burst of dopamine. When we make a sound we like with a modular, we get a little burst of dopamine. And it's funny, for those of us selling hardware, actually we get a burst of dopamine every time you buy them too. Well, it's there you go. <laughs> that's, that's why, that's why I, I have a strong feeling about iOS as well, because mm -hmm. everything's so affordable that you can, get, you can just push a button and get your dopamine from the App Store. Um, but, the, but, but those techniques, you know, that, that, that produces dopamine, and so if, once you start making credible or at least moderately convincing weather sounds, you'll get a burst of dopamine, and that will inspire you to add something to it. When I make escape, I start with the environment, whether, you know, I, I figure out what, it's like uh, uh, setting up a, a play. So I, I start with, okay, I'm gonna set the stage, this is gonna be the, the scenery in the stage, and then, I'm, and then I choose my characters for it. Okay, it's gonna be birds, or it's gonna be a woman walking through a city street, or it's gonna be a car in the distance, et cetera. So I pick, the different, the different characters in, on that stage, and then I figure out what the characters are doing. But that's, that's where my head has gone since I started hitting the wall with presets. Mm -hmm. I love doing presets. It's not like I'm bored with presets. It's just that I You can still I wanna, hire a friend, by the way, for presets. If any I, wanna, I just for, always want to challenge yeah. myself. Do you, well, that, that, and that brings back to the sort of uh, throwing the cat at the modular uh, metaphor that you used. Right? Oh, yeah, okay, the throwing, the throwing of the cat. Um, Which is both cruel to the cat and cruel to the modular. Yeah, yeah. And then won't, I mean, I, but, it, you know, if, you're, if what you're describing is, um, what you're describing is still trial and error somehow, and you're, you're trying things and then listening to the result and then adjusting. Um, if you can't do it twice, you haven't learned anything. Sure, and I, but I assume also that if, if you're intentional about your experiment... Correct. You're going to not only be able to reproduce, you're going to have more discoveries, right, than if, yeah. you, if you're unintentional. So, I mean, usually the sound, that sound of being random with the modular is kind of the same all the time, right? I mean, if, you, if you're just sort of chaotic and not paying attention to parameters, it, there's not so many happy accidents. Right? You're well, mostly going to get some of the same kinds of sounds. Well, some synths have a little randomize button on them. A lot of soft synths will have like a little button called randomize. That's the same as throwing your cat as a, at a modular. I mean, it's like you may, there may be more tactile, you know, cables, but I think it's, it's really important to learn from each, learn what elements in each sound you like. And to go back to, I find cooking analogies are really, really useful. Hmm. You know, I like to you cook. You don't want to randomize cooking. No, <laughs> randomizing <laughs> cooking is a, mm. is, a, is a terrible idea. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I guess even if, if somebody were sort of fond of the randomize button, to, to come back to your earlier point, you can hit the randomize button, but they can still pull apart the yeah, parameters all, that they a, see as a result. It's all open source. It's like you yeah. hit the randomize button and something great happens. Figure out what it is about it that you think is great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I'd like to pause and take some audience questions. Yeah, let's do point. questions. I pay attention to what time it was. There's one already ready. So we have a microphone floating around. So we're going there. Nope, nope, nope. To your right. To your right. <laughs> and then, then there. And okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question going back to the beginning. Um, in general, you're um, talking about you're working a lot with emulation and copying nature. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a um, comparing this to this is the synthesizing of sounds and going, uh, you know, almost like close to nature, never really reaching it, having one aesthetical qu uh, quality, which is, of course, as all synthesized music, um, can be quite imaginative, suggestive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you feel about, what's your approach? If, if you ever, in music or sound design, have to combine this with the world of real acoustic recording. Mm -hmm. So um, this would be, you could compare it to graphic design mm -hmm. inside of photography or Correct. 3D mm -hmm. art in a movie which is aesthetically can be in special effects often kind of uh, disgusting or weird looking. Mm -hmm. How do you... Oh, the uncanny valley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, what's the approach on hyper, hyper uh, basically combining hyper-realism or like this aesthetic of um, synthesis with um, real recordings in one project? Um, one of the things if I understand your question correctly, um, 
one of the things I've noticed is that, the, that music, recordings in general, but music specifically, stands up to many more repeated listenings if there is some kind of chaos in it. It's the same reason that people mm. like, oh, I want a real analog synth, not a soft synth. And that's because in a case of a real analog synth, you're gonna have you know, minute changes in pitch, you're gonna have the, the oscillators are always hitting at a different point in phase every time you hit a key. So anytime a sound it, it can be somewhat more complex and have a little bit more chaos in it, for instance, if you're using like a, a Lorenz modulator for anybody who knows what those are, you, the, you're going, the music or the, whatever the context is gonna be is going to stand up to repeated listenings for a longer period of time. And I think that that would be how I would, I would fuse hyper-real um, types of sounds. One of my class projects um, for my students um, is actually the opposite of scapes, where I give them a recording of cows in a pasture, and I say, all right, you have to make all your sounds from this. And they'll make mm. a kick drum and a snare drum and a hi-hat, and then bass sounds and so on and so forth, by taking a complex nature sound and using that as the source for all their, their more synthetic sounds. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yes, repetition exactly. versus chaos. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, you've done some field recording as well. I mean, so it, when you're describing listening, what, what's really what's what's really intrinsic to your listening process is actively reproducing. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. The, this is what's allowing you to, and I guess being active is also what's allowing you to hear those birds as sine waves and well, with pitch envelopes. And yeah, the, 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 yeah. There's there's very active listening. And the other thing, though, is like we look at painting. You know, the the artist is trying to capture the the landscape, the mountain, the still life, so on and so forth. But it, depending on their style, if they're going to be hyper realistic, like. Um, my drawing a complete blank, I'm sorry. Um, but if they're going to be either hyper-realistic or they're going to be more expressionistic, you can, you can get both of those elements into it simultaneously when you're painting these, these sort of still lifes or, or landscapes with hmm. sound. Yeah, this is a, a Gauguin, is the painter who uh, was actually really opposed to doing any kind of painting uh, on site or only believed in kind of doing this from memory. Uh, um, really? So I guess it's kind of a parallel sort of set of philosophical questions here, but you know, I mean, obviously some people are really into the idea of deep listening as being field recording and kind of removing yourself from the process or, mm -hmm. or, or um, being more active in your listening by being less active in your sound production or just kind of listening through headphones and the microphone and, and not putting some sort of active sound production into the process. I don't know if you've played with that. These um, kind of different roles at all? Well, memory is really, really interesting because everybody in yeah. this room can remember a song that they really like. And to, to mention a song that everybody in the room knows, everybody knows All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. Everybody knows that song. And when they remember it, what level of detail are you remembering the track? Are you, are you remembering, are you remembering the, 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 the horn, the descending horn part at the end? Are you remembering the super high vocal harmonies that are sort of at the end? Are you remembering the part where they burst into She Loves You at the end? Um, how detailed is your memory of the music you're listening to? I think that's a really, really good way to get a better handle on how actively you're listening. So I know there was a question over here, if we can send the microphone. Then. Uh, thanks. Um, I was wondering, uh, you were talking a lot about um, like mastering something mm -hmm. and um, seeing the results before you start doing something. Yes. And like, this is where I want to end yes. up. Yes. Um, and I want to ask um, where you draw new inspiration from, or do you see it more as like a more technical, scientific uh, thing? Uh, for myself, I've, after a while, when, when I've gotten really used to some of the tools I'm using, mm -hmm. one of the things that really helped me to be creative while I'm producing music mm -hmm. is just trying to work as fast as possible. Yes. So I just like stay in the music. And yes. Yeah. The um, distance between the artistic thought mm -hmm. and the technical, uh, what you have to do to create it is very short. And then it feels kind of like a, almost like a jam session. Uh, and I was wondering what kind of stuff that inspires you? Um, what kind of music inspires me? What kind of... 
mu- music and um, techniques and where, where do you feel you're still learning and getting some new inputs that actually gets you excited and it doesn't feel like okay I'll, that's really cool there's some different stuff on this synth I'll make some presets uh, that's cool so on but like really get passionate and excited about it I've become fascinated by the idea of learning how to play guitar as soon as it stops hurting my fingers so every time I want like I have a, I have a couple of guitars and I like pick them up every once in a while and I'm like oh wow this is really cool it's so organic it's a really great experience and then my fingers hurt and I put it away um, but the, but, but, and, and, I, and I mean that. I have two guitars that I keep fiddling with. Um, in terms of the music I listen to, I listen to a preposterous amount of, of acoustic and sort of, you know, older music. I'm a big fan. Have you ever heard of a Mexican artist named Esquivel? Check up. Does anybody know Esquivel? Yeah, Esquivel's really... Esquivel um, gets lumped in with the Space Age bachelor pad. Hmm. Um, movement, which is sort of 60s lounge music, but he really sort of is super far ahead of the curve in terms of what we call synthesis now, because he would have, um, he would double really unusual instruments, like he would have a, a, a group, of, a choir, or a group of people sing pow, while also simultaneously having a brass hit, a brass section, play a chord that did that, and that's Layering and sample, that's, instru- that's instrument racks and a couple of samplers. Um, so and so those, are the, those are the types of things that inspire me, is, is, is a lot more acoustic stuff. Partly because it gives me, like what we were talking about earlier with, in terms of chaos. The sounds are, are not easily predictable. Um, that's not all I listen to. In terms of electronic music, I find the, I find the, the new Rolly stuff really interesting because you can't just, it's not a keyboard where you're pushing buttons and getting notes. It's like if you turn on the side-to-side movement, if your finger's not hitting that key correctly, it's not going to sound good. So you actually have to put a little work into it. So I find that sort of interesting too. Do you work quickly? Pardon me? We, we also, he also brought up the sort of speed... Speed question. Do you work quickly? Um, yeah. I, well, yeah. I actually, when I'm making music, um, I, when, I, when I was younger, I would get, like, my, as soon as I kind of liked an idea, I would be determined to finish that song and never actually finish it. Um, now, if I've got, say, four weeks to make one song, I'm going to spend the first week and I'm going to make 10 ideas and I'm going to get them as far as I possibly can. And then from those 10 ideas, I'm going to pick the best one and then finesse that. But it's a matter of, like you were saying, it's like this sort of rapid fire creativity. You know, you get a verse and a chorus, a couple of sounds happening, some drums. You can quickly, you know, you might, it's very tempting to follow that to its conclusion, even if it's the wrong conclusion and you don't get anything out of it. But if you get 10 ideas and then you choose, after listening to all 10, that you very, you know, in a state of flow and it's all very intuitive, you get to that point where you can, you can more clearly see which of your ideas are actually good. Thank you so much. It seems like uh, you need a couple more random buttons then, yeah. if you like the acoustic <laughs> instruments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. that would, yeah, actually that would be a really interesting feature to be able to randomize certain elements of pitch and timbre. So I can grab a couple more questions. I wasn't looking over his other people feel yes, urgently. Yes, there's a question them. over here. Sure. But we need to, can we get the microphone over there? Speak loudly. Okay. No, no, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> so out of all the sonic tools available to you, which is the habanero pepper uh, to add to your music, to bring in your food uh, love? Uh, <laughs> if resonance is cilantro. <laughs> resonance is cilantro. What's what the... is beans? <laughs> what um, <laughs> I think it depends on whether or not you like habanero peppers. Um, I, the thing that you just add a tiny bit of, is that, where, is that, is that where you're going? I would say distortion. Because distortion is going to give you a little <laughs> bit of that chaos. And then okay. you blend it back in. I really like too much habanero pepper. You're, there's some people like And I do f- really also like really too much distortion. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, yeah, maybe this metaphor holds. I think we can hand, handle one more question if we look for that. But uh, Yes. So you said that distortion is your pepper <clears throat> in yeah. terms of cooking. Um, yeah. So yeah, I discovered that like distortion gives you another timbers, uh, same as using uh, reverb, chorus, flanger on mm. the uh, sound. So what is your thought on processing versus the source? 
whether it's really important to have a really good source on that processing can handle actually the sound creation. Processing in terms processing of with effects. Uh, processing processing with effects is crucial. If you, for instance, are you familiar with the Arp Selena string machine or old vintage 70s string machines? Like for instance, the, the string sound that I made, that's just a plain old single oscillator, really vanilla, very simple sawtooth. And the, 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 the thing that turns it into something that sounds more similar to a string orchestra is the fact that I threw a chorus and a reverb and a chorus on it. And the choruses serve the function of multiplying that sawtooth to create, say, multiple violins. And the reverb gives us the, the sound that we're most familiar with when we hear an orchestra is the hall. So those effects make sense as a string thing because the choruses are multiplying the, the single sawtooth and the reverb is creating the hall effect. So I think that effects are absolutely crucial. And I, I really, um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I really like about both Max for live devices and um, in, in the case of X for Serum is the fact that you can use the LFOs and the envelopes to modulate the effect parameters and things get very, very interesting. Even if it's paraphonic, thing, you know, being able to modulate the parameters of an effect with traditional synthesis tools like LFOs and, and, and envelopes can, can really, really impressive results. But it's just a matter of experimentation. That's one of those places where you can throw your cat at the modular until you find something you like and then figure out why you like it and what you did. Is, is which part? The the, the playing with effects and, with and effects. things like L, you know throwing so, LFOs and, and envelopes on effects. And so on that note, we'll leave it. LFOs are the time when it's okay to throw your cat at the modulus, <laughs> but not literally. <laughs> please, please leave your cat alone. Thanks so much, Francis, for. All right. Um, Thank you, Peter. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.